Hello and welcome to section 5 of our journey into mastering the Go programming language. In the previous section, we covered another advanced topic, which was how to design object-oriented software in the Go language. In this section, we will dive deeper into advanced topics in the Go world. We will cover locks, timers, we will cover some important concurrency patterns, We'll cover reflection, and we'll build some pieces of the Hydra along the way. Now let's move to the first video in this section. Sinks and locks. So even though Go prefers channels and Go routines for concurrent tasks, there are cases where locking memory is inevitable. In this video, we will discuss three key features for allowing thread locking. First, we will cover regular lockers and mutexes. Then we will talk about the ones type. Then we will conclude by talking about weight groups. So in Go, to access any functionality related to thread locking, we need to use the sync package which is a standard package in Go as shown here. So there are numerous features enabled by sync. However, for us we will focus on the most useful and commonly used features. You can get to the sync package directly by going to golang.org for slash pkg for slash sync. First, let's discuss locks and mutexes. The most common type related to locks in Go is the locker interface type, which encapsulates the functionality for locking and unlocking in Go. So it has the lock uh, method and the unlock method. So in order to enable the functionality of the locker interface, we can use the mutex struct type, which will provide the ability to lock and unlock pieces of code between threads or to be more accurate code between go routines locking is an important feature in any modern programming language we need to avoid race conditions when multiple go routines need to access the same memory space let's explore some code here to learn how to use the mutex type so we'll start by defining the package as main in our code. Then we will import the fimp package and the sync package. So sync package is a package we're learning. Then we'll create a new struct type called safe counter. Safe counter basically will become an object type which can increment an integer, which is uh, the i integer here safely between go routines meaning that when we use safe counter and we try to increment i it will ensure that no two go routines can increment i at the same time and we will use the mutex for that notice here that the sync.mutex type is added to the struct fields via embedding which we discussed in video 4.2. And by doing this, we can embed the functionality of sync.mutex directly to save counter. Now, before we cover the main function, let's look at the increment and the decrement methods for the save counter. So we will implement our methods on a pointer to save counter as shown. And first thing we do before we either increment or decrement is to issue a lock. So we will lock the mutex and because we use embedding we can call the lock method of the mutex directly. So in case of increment uh, after doing the lock we will increment i and then we will unlock. In case of decrement we will do the same except that we will decrement from i. Of course we must always unlock the mutex at the end to release the log for other go routines to use. And that shows us a simple example of how mutex object could be used. 
to protect a piece of code, which is the incrementation of i here. At the end, let's implement an accessor in order to get the value of i. So the method will be called get value, and it will return the value of i. Now in the main function, we'll start our code by initializing a new safe counter pointer object by using the new keyword. And then we will use a for loop to create a bunch of go routines to increment or decrement the integer concurrently. The integer here, of course, being like the uh, field i inside our safe counter. So for every single iteration for this for loop, we will increment in a go routine and we will decrement on a, another go routine. And we'll continue doing that for 100 counts. Now at the end, we will get the value of i by calling get value, and we'll print it to the uh, standard output. So this for loop will allow us to run numerous go routines at the same time. This will allow us to test the locks. Now it's important to note that this code is still susceptible uh, race conditions and that is because we don't have a lock in the get value method when we're returning the value so that means that get value could get called at the same time as when we're either incrementing or decrementing so in order to test our code and see the effect of the locks i will leave the get value method without a lock and I will run the code with an important go tool flag called dash race, which help us detect race conditions. So the file name here is 5.1-1 go, because this is uh, the first code file in section 5.1. So if I hit enter, we see a warning here of a data race. So that's what the dash race flag can provide. It let us know of possible race conditions in our code. This is a very powerful tool to use when testing concurrent code. So if you look at the warning here, we will find that it warns us about the fact that the code at line 22, which is where we're calling a get value, without the lock could collide with the code at 27, which is when we're doing the increment. So it looks like when we tried to run the code, the increment collided with uh, the get value method and a race condition risk occurred. Now to see the effect of the locks, let's do something like that. So assign sc.i to a variable called v, then return v, and then lock the piece of code that handles the value assignment. So let's see that, and we'll run the code again with the dash race flag as before, but this time we get no warnings. Let's try again. Same thing. No warning. Let's try a third time. No race warnings whatsoever. And that is because the lock and unlock statements we placed here protected this piece of code against a race condition that occurs when we try to retrieve i while it's being incremented or decremented. Awesome. Now let's discuss a more complex type of mutex which is a read-write mutex. This mutex allows two types of locks, uh, read locks and write locks. It allows Go routines to read data concurrently, but only write data via a single writer or a single Go routine that does the writing. So the read-write mutex is simply named RW mutex. When using RW mutex, the lock method needs to be used 
when doing writes, whereas the rlock method need to be used when doing reads. The RW mutex is more efficient than the standard mutex if a large number of reads are expected from different Go routines. That is because the rlock method will not cause your Go routines to block if there are multiple reads. However, when a write lock engages, everything will lock, including the other write locks as well as the read locks. And that's how the RW mutex protect against race conditions when it comes to uh, executing writes on data. A very good use case for uh, read write mutex is to protect reads and writes on maps. That is because map types are not thread safe by default in the Go language. So let's write a thread safe map using our new knowledge. So the design pattern in Go to create a thread safe or a Go routine safe map is to create a struct type which will contain our map as well as the RW mutex object. Again, here we use embedding to include the RW mutex object so that we can access the um, RW mutex methods directly uh, from the map counter. Now in our main function, let's create an object of type map counter where we will initialize the map field. So we use a struct literal initialization here to initialize the map field in the map counter struct and we store this object in a variable called mc. Now before we explore the rest of the main function, let's look at the writer and reader uh, functions. So we'll start with the run writer function, which will write values to the map inside a for loop. We do that to test concurrency. This should actually be called writers because we are doing multiple writers. So we'll create a for loop that will uh, do an n number of iterations and n is the second argument passed to the run writers function. The first arguments passed to the run writers is a map counter object or a pointer to the map counter object. Our thread safe or uh, go routine safe map. Then inside the for loop, we will call the write locks of the map counter. And this would be the RW mutex write lock. Then we will assign a value to a key in the map. So because this is testing code, we will use some random values here. So we will use the value of i here, like the uh, number of our iteration as the key. And then we will multiply i by 10 and have that as uh, the value that belongs to the i key. We then unlock after we're done with the right operation in our map. And then we sleep for one second. So this is to simulate some delays in this function. We will write another function to simulate multiple readers trying to uh, read a random value from the map. The function will be called run readers and it will take the, a pointer to the map um, as an argument as well as an integer argument called n. And then for the readers, we will have an endless for loop where we will do an R lock, so a read lock on the map counter. Again, this R lock comes from the embedded type RW mutex. And then we do a random read. Uh, so we use a random package for that. We use rand.intem. Then we pass n. N here should be the number of items in our map. So when we call rand.intn and then pass in as an argument, we are basically asking for values between 0 till uh, n minus 1. 
then after we are done with the random read we unlock we print out uh, the random value retreat from the map and then we sleep for a second again to simulate some additional work you will notice here that we are using a pointer to the map counter object in the run readers and run writers functions and the reason why we do that is to ensure we pass the map counter object here by reference so in go passing by reference is the same as a pointer so when we have the argument of type pointer then that allows us to pass the value by reference in our main code and the reason why we want to pass value by reference is because in Go we need to use a reference in order to retain the original object and that is important because we want to run the writers and the readers on the same object we don't want to pass copies of the object we want the exact same object we defined here so that we can test concurrent code on the same piece of data in our main function we will run three different go routines one will be for the writers and the other two will be for the readers we make the readers run forever whereas the writers will run 10 times as we pass 10 here then we will use a sleep statement in order to prevent our program from exiting before the readers and the writers run for a little while so this piece of code in effect will run a bunch of writers and a bunch of readers concurrently reading and writing on the same object which is mc so let's see if that's first so let's open this code in a terminal in order to run it and let's use the race flag we explored earlier to detect if there are any race conditions so we see here that the reads are going fine and the values are changing so the writes are going as well so everything seems good now what if I comment out the write locks in our code now let's try to run the same command again with the dash race flag and see what we get and right away we get a warning and that is because our rights are not protected anymore a race condition can occur between a go routine writing to this object and another go routine reading from the object cool and that shows us the power of the uh, rw mutex so another important construct that we need to cover is the once type we have covered the once uh, struct in the past in video 4.4 when we wrote the hydra logger so when the once type is enabled it allows us to run a piece of code only once over the lifetime of our application and prevent uh, the piece of code from ever getting executed again so the way to use once is uh, as shown here in the example in the uh, sync package page so we uh, in here we wrote a function called once buddy and then in order to run this function once we just run uh, once dot do so when we call once to do and pass a function with that signature to the once to do method this function will only get executed once for the lifetime of our program so if you look here we see here that the once to do here gets called inside the go routine which gets called inside a for loop of 10 counts so even though this code exists inside the for loop of 10 counts this function once body will only get executed once so when i run this i should see only once once so let's try that we see here we see it only once 
However, if I comment that out and just run once body, like any regular function, uh, so to and the sync package because we're not using it anymore. So if I format and hit run now, we see here only once re repeated 10 times. So let's revisit the H logger code and look at where we used once.do. So as shown, we used it to ensure that the Hydra logger object will only be created once through the lifetime of our application or microservice. And we did that to ensure that a single logger will serve our entire application. So the way we activated once was the same as in the example. First, we created a variable of type sync.once. So typically, people call the variable once, but of course we can call it however name we like. And then when we needed to use the once object, we just called the do method and we passed a function with that signature to the do method. Perfect. Another important type in the sync package is the wait group. We use the wait group to wait for a collection of Go routines to finish. Let's see how we use it in our code. Let's see a code example where we use the wait group. So uh, this will be a test program. So the package will be package main and we will import a bunch of packages here for our use. So we'll import FEMT. Uh, math rand because we will uh, try to obtain a random value. We'll obtain sync, of course, to uh, get hold of the weight group type, and we will uh, import the time package. Now let's start our main function. So we start by creating a variable called wg of type weight group. So this will be our weight group object, which we'll use in our code. Then we'll create a bunch of go routines inside a for loop. So the for loop will count from zero to five. So the, those will be six counts. And for each iteration, we will call wg.add. And add is a method in the weight group object, which increases the weight group counter by the number we pass as an argument. So the weight group counter is basically a number that we can use to identify the number of Go routines that are waiting on the weight group. To use a counter, we need to add one to it whenever we're about to create a new Go routine. So when we do wg.add one before our Go routine, we incremented the weight group counter by one right before we called our go routine. Then inside our go routine, first thing we do is call defer wg.done, whereas the done method will decrement the weight group counter by one. We can see here uh, when we go to the uh, weight group code in the go standard package, we see here that done is nothing but calling add with negative one. So just decrementing the weight group counter by one. So when we call done with a defer, we ensure that done will get called as this function or this go routine is exiting. We will then, then simulate uh, some work by using time.sleep to sleep for a random duration from zero to two seconds. Then we print out the fact that work is done. And then we close our for loop. And then at the end, whenever we want to listen on a wait group or actually wait on a wait group, we call wg.wait or wait group.wait. So basically wait is a method in a wait group object that blocks the calling go routine till the wait group counter is zero. That means that our main function will block here till all the go routines called wg.done and exit. So that's how simple weight groups are. Again, you just call add 
before you start your new go routine then you call wg.done inside your go routine you can either use defer to make sure it gets called uh, as your go routine exits or you can just manually write it at the end of uh, the go routine function so let's run this code and see how it fares so i do go run then we use a file name so 5.1-3.go we hit enter and it actually runs so we see here that uh, we get the message that work was done for each iteration and at the end it exits and notice here how our main function waited till every single go routine was done perfect if we go back to the sync package page and look at the weight group example we'll find here a nice example for a real use case for weight groups in this example we use weight group to write a performant web client that fetches a bunch of url concurrently using uh, http get this saves time and increases performance then at the end we block the calling go routine till all the urls are processed concurrently in this video we learned how to sync our code between multiple go routines this will be an additional tool in our arsenal to design powerful software in the go language